Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the chance to open your word together. Lord, we thank you for the lesson from the leper, and the lesson from the centurion that we will study today. And Father, for thousands of years, you have taught people about the salvation that you offer through these two accounts. And so, Father, this morning we are calling upon your spirit to take the word of God and to make application where applicable. I pray that it would bring us to a realization of our sin, to a recognition of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and furthermore, of his ability to do that which he promises to do. Father, for those who already know the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that this morning we will become stronger, deeper in our recognition of the true gospel and the elements of the true gospel that are present in these accounts that we'll study together this morning. All of this for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. Matthew chapter 8, when he came down from the mountain, if you compare that with Matthew chapter 5 verse 1, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. Jesus preached that sermon on the mount, and when he came down on the mountain, the events of Matthew chapter 8 unfolded as we might understand it immediately, at least as far as our text would indicate this morning. And it says, Great crowds followed him. They loved him as a teacher. If you look at what it says in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 28. 7 and verse 28. And when Jesus finished these sayings, that is the sermon that he preached up on that mountain, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. So there's this amazing following that Jesus is gathering, and on his way down from the mountain, as he begins to go live and be engaged in civilized society again, he immediately runs into a leper. And the thought in the back of everyone's mind is, I saw an amazing teacher. He said amazing things. In particular, I love this statement that really summarizes the Sermon on the Mount. Look with me at Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. In fact, I have it here on the PowerPoint for you. Jesus summarized the entire Sermon on the Mount before he closes with the warnings that we looked at last week. The summary statement of it all is this. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. People loved Jesus as a teacher. They were astonished at his teaching. They're like, this guy's spot on. He teaches with one, as one who has authority and not like our scribes and our, and our Pharisees, our religious leaders. He's different than them. But as Matthew begins to unfold the stories that will happen in rapid succession over the next few chapters, he wastes no time in answering this question. Does Jesus practice what he preaches? Or is Jesus himself one of those wolves in sheep's clothing? And friends, Jesus does more than practice what he preaches. Jesus exceeds our expectations. Verse 2 is where this unfolding of Jesus as a man who lives what he teaches begins. We're told in verse 2, Behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him. You need to understand this. Leprosy is not a technical term. Leprosy is a general term that speaks of any one of a number of skin diseases. Some of them could be very, uh, very insignificant. They would pass after a week or so, no harm, no foul. But there were other skin diseases that in the Jewish community, they recognized these things are dangerous and they'll spread within the rest of the camp. And if you had a particular kind of skin disease, there were specific regulations about how that was to be handled. 
in the book of Leviticus chapter 13, verses 45 through 46, this is what it says about someone who had been identified by a priest as having a uh, communicable skin disease. This is the way they were to be treated. Look what it says. A leprous person, this is directly out of the Old Testament, okay? Leviticus 13, 45 through 46, the leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. According to gotquestions.org, they added a little bit more information to this. The Talmud, which was a very respected teaching and, and writing of the Jewish culture and of the Jewish people, said this in addition to what the scriptures says. And these rules were no doubt practiced by the Jewish religious community at large, but it said this, a leper wasn't allowed to come within six feet of any other human, including his own family. The disease was considered so revolting that the leper wasn't permitted to come within 150 feet of anyone when the wind was blowing. And you think we have rough quarantine rules. <laughs> lepers lived in a community with other lepers until either they got better or died. This was the only way the people knew to contain the spread of the contagious forms of leprosy. Friends, here comes Jesus. Jesus who proclaims a message of love your neighbor as yourself. Give to the one who asks of you. Don't judge lest you be judged. And as soon as he comes down the mountain, he's confronted by a leper, a man who's wearing ripped and shaggy clothing. His hair might be hanging down as far as his waist. He has to hold his hand over his mouth and say, unclean, unclean. And people are backing away from him. We don't want to get close to this guy. We don't want what he has. Some commentators said leprosy was a, was a fate that was almost worse than death. Because you lived in isolation People terrified to even be around you, and as the disease would spread throughout your body, it was basically, in some forms, a nerve-numbing a nerve -numbing thing, and people would, would lose, uh, they, they, would, they would cut themselves and not know they were cut, and then that would, that would get ill, and then it would, it would bleed and fester, and then they'd have to have amputation after amputation after amputation. It was despicable. Here comes a leper. Verse 2, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Oh, I think of blessed are the poor in spirit. Think about Jesus, blessed are the meek. Blessed are the, the, the merciful. Give to him who asks of you. They understood Jesus' teaching, but how far does it really go? Aren't there some provisos? Aren't there some things? Aren't there some people to which these living this way doesn't apply? Aren't there some, uh, some, some social distancing requirements that we ought to enact and we ought to stay away from these people? We ought not touch them. We ought not engage them. Let them stay over there. These rules only apply to civilized society, certainly not those that have been put outside the camp. It says in verse 3, and Jesus stretched out his hand and did what? Look at the text. Verse 3, and Jesus stretched out his hand and he did what? He touched him. I think that's a significant detail. You know why? Because later in the same chapter, in chapter 8, verse 13, the centurion will send an envoy to come and talk to Jesus about a, about a, a servant who's back at his house dying and Jesus wants to come to his house and heal that servant. He says, no, 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 I'm not even worthy for you to come under my roof. We'll get to all that in a minute. He says, just speak the word and you can make him better. And the scripture records for us that Jesus spoke the word and instantly the servant was healed. Does Jesus have to touch the leper to heal him? Answer, no. And you're going to see as we go through the remainder of these miracles uh, over chapter 8 and chapter 9 and chapter 10 and moving forward, it was not necessary for Jesus to make physical contact with anybody to heal them. 
But you need to understand the compassion, the acceptance, the fellowship that Jesus extends to the least of these. That man probably hadn't been touched by another human being, and who knows how long. Probably the remainder of the crowd that's following with Jesus and they're an entourage behind him. What is this guy? We'll follow this man to the grave. We're excited. Nobody teaches like him. He's astonishing. He's better than the scribes and the Pharisees. He's, he's great. And then comes this leper and he's unclean, unclean. And he's got his long hair and his ripped clothes and everybody's backing away and saying, oh, Jesus, watch out. And Jesus walks right up to him. He touches him. It's remarkable, isn't it? Jesus did more than just heal this man. He accepted the man and he demonstrated that acceptance by touching him, by coming close. Leprosy in the Old Testament was usually associated with sin. Uh, in the story of Miriam from the Old Testament, this was Moses' sister. She had wanted to serve in a more prestigious office at that time, and she sinned in her desire to do so, and God struck her with leprosy, and immediately she was put out of the camp. Moses prayed for her, and the leprosy was healed. There was another king, Uzziah, who again wanted to do more than what God permitted kings to do. He wanted to offer incense on the altar of God. And he went into the, altar, into the temple to do such a thing. And God immediately struck him with leprosy. And he had leprosy till the day that he died. In the Old Testament, leprosy was associated with sin. As this man came, a symbol, a man, surely everyone in the, in the, in the group of people that was following Jesus said, this man's a sinner, he's unclean, and he wears the evidence of his uncleanness on the outside as a social outcast who's not even able to live around us. And Jesus came close enough and touched him. Leprosy is a visual illustration of the grotesqueness of our sin. As believers, Jesus does more than forgive our sin. He comes to dwell within us. Amen? That's the story of the leper. That's where his story and our story merge. No, I may not have putrefying sores on my body. I may not have hair that hangs down to my waist because I'm not permitted to cut it. And I may not be wearing ripped clothes this morning. But I'm telling you, as a seventh grade boy before God saved me, my heart was just as evil and as ugly and as disgusting and as grotesque as this leper. But I'm in good company this morning, aren't I? Because your heart was exactly the same. And yet when you bowed your knee, when you came to a recognition of your fallen condition, of your grotesque condition in your sin, what did you do? You said, Lord, I know who you are. If you will, you can make me clean. And you asked Jesus to care for the sin of your heart. And he cleaned it. Did he touch you? Oh yeah, he came close. He came to dwell and live within you. Friends, that's the promise of salvation, that when we believe, Jesus doesn't remain as some remote being on the outside, but God comes near. The promise of the Holy Spirit is sent into us and changes us. He lives at one with us. If any man is joined unto the Lord's Spirit, they are one spirit. That is a miracle, amen? Jesus comes close. Jesus tells the man, oh, before we go there, I want you to note the elements of saving faith. He calls him Lord in verse 2. There's an admission of his uncleanness. Lord, you can make me clean. He recognized he needed this, and he trusts he says, if you will. All who come to Jesus with poverty of spirit, recognizing that they live apart from God because of their sin and ask him to forgive, he will not only forgive, he will indwell. He will make you his friend. He'll make you a joint heir with Christ. He'll give you an eternal life. He'll give you an inheritance. Jesus exceeds our expectations. I want to move, let's just finish this up. Look with me at verse 4. 
Jesus said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for proof of them. Scripture isn't exactly clear as to why he told him not to say anything. It's clear from Mark's account that this man did not obey what Jesus said. And as a result of his failure to obey, Jesus could not walk freely into town any longer. Because every time he did, he got mobbed with people who wanted healing. But I also thought of another reason. Perhaps it could be that Jesus healed this man and wanted it to be kept a private matter because of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. Do not your good deeds before others to be seen by them. Then they have their reward. Perhaps Jesus not meaning to make a spectacle of the leper, but just desiring to show the man his love for him. Jesus is remarkable. Jesus also wanted to recognize that he did not come to destroy the law. Remember, he said that in the Sermon on the Mount, but he came to fulfill. And so Jesus instructed the man, the leper, as you can see there in verse 4, go to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. Notice that last little phrase at the end, for a proof to them. These priests had identified these putrefying skin diseases in many people. Many a bad day at the office happened for a priest as he would tell somebody, your life has changed, put the ripped clothing on, never cut your hair, and go live outside the camp. I can imagine that very few were the times when one of those came from the leper camp back and said, I'm clean. And yet Jesus said, you go and you pay what Moses commanded to be paid for a proof to them. Show them that you have been healed. This would have been unique. It would have sent a signal, a sign, if you will, to the priests. There's a healer in town. Something different is going on. You know, interesting, when Jesus saves us, there's a change in our lives, isn't there? Oh, boy, I was weak. I got to give some amen lessons. That's a time to say amen. Amen. When Jesus saves us, there's a change in our lives, amen, that other people can see. And when they recognize that I once was this way, but I'm being changed into someone who's now this way, that's a noticeable change, and it's a proof to others that they too need Jesus Christ, and they need to be born again. They need the healing offered through Jesus Christ. All right, enough on that. He moves into... Another story. Let's see if we can find some similar themes in this second account. Verse 5. When he entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him. Centurion, who was that? It was a Roman officer. Are they friends of the Jews? Not characteristically, although Luke's account would tell us that this particular centurion was friendly toward the Jewish people. But naturally speaking, he's a Roman, a Roman soldier in charge of a hundred other soldiers, the enemy of Israel. How will Jesus engage with this enemy? We see how he interacts with the least of these, the outcast, the, the leper. How will he engage with someone who's the enemy of the state of Israel? Let's look at it together. Matthew 8, verse 5. When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. We see these facts that the centurion is desperate for help, isn't he? We see that in verse 6. We see that Jesus was willing to heal the centurion's servant in verse 7. The man identifies that he's unworthy to have the Lord even enter into his house in verse 8. And then you've got this remarkable statement by the centurion who understood the, the relationship between men and authority And he knew that Jesus' personal presence was not necessary, only his command in areas of his authority. 
Since Jesus is God and commands all things, he need only speak the word and sickness must flee. What an amazing statement of faith, isn't it? I mean, if I had my one shot with Jesus and I had somebody who was lying sick at home, a loved one that I cared deeply about, I would want him to come in my house. I'd forget that the decor ain't like it is in heaven. I want you there so that there's nothing that hinders this, but he understands this. If as the Jewish people, and again, Luke tells us a lot that, that the centurion was, was very kind to the Jewish people, that he was responsible for the building of the synagogue and different things like that. Chances are he had studied, they had told him things about their Messiah. Chances are he understood some of the prophecies that if this is the guy, he doesn't need any help. He can do absolutely anything because he's God of the universe. And all he has to do is speak the word and my servant will be healed. I want you to notice in verse 10. Verse 10, when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, how quickly we cross over, we just gloss over words like that. Do you know that there's only one other instance in the entire New Testament that Jesus was amazed? The only other time that Jesus is amazed in the New Testament Oh, and I had it here somewhere, but oh yeah, in Mark chapter 6, verse 6, he marveled at their unbelief. Here is the only stated time that we know that Jesus was absolutely amazed at what he saw. This is indeed a rare statement. You've got a leper who comes to Jesus in great desperation. That makes sense. But a Roman soldier? A guy who's outside the covenant community of Israel? A wealthy, powerful man with the greatest access to the best medicine at that time? He's coming, and he doesn't even want the healer to come to his house? Just say the word, and my servant will be healed? Here's the people who should have believed. Israel. Israel... They had, the, they had the Old Testament. They understood what the prophecy said. They understood who Jesus was. And yet those people struggled most with faith. It amazed Jesus that someone would trust him so much. He says as much in verse 11, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I think it important for us to take a moment Anytime we study through the Gospels, there's always this confusing confusion in this interplay. Jesus has not yet died for sin. He has not been buried. He has not risen again, obviously. At this point, people are saved by recognizing that Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah. That was the ministry of John the Baptist as he went ahead of the Messiah declaring, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the Messiah. Uh, earlier, later in chapter 11 of, of Matthew, uh, there was a little bit of confusion. Is this really the guy? And Jesus confirms to his satisfaction, yes, this is the guy. But people at this time acknowledged their faith in Jesus Christ simply by believing that Jesus was the Messiah. If you think back to the thief on the cross, what did he say? I know you're dying for my sins, that you're going to bury and be right, risen again the third day. No, he had no idea. He was no theologian. He just simply looked at Jesus and recognized he was the Messiah and said, Hey, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, Today you'll be with me in paradise. And that man got saved. Why? Because he recognized who Jesus was, the Messiah. We have more information than they had at that time. And it's important that you understand, otherwise the gospel narrative gets lost. You're like, where's the gospel in all this? Oh my goodness, I'm going to show you in just a moment that the gospel is absolutely here. Our information and what we are to trust in is far exceeds what they needed to trust. They had to trust that Jesus was who he said he was. It is incumbent upon us as people who have access to the whole of Scripture that we believe that Jesus Christ was God in human flesh, that he died as a substitute payment for our sins, and that he rose again three days later. You cannot be saved 
at this time period without believing those three things. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 3 lay this out. Paul says, uh, you know the gospel, that Christ died according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He defines the gospel, the good news, as that message that Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. And if you're here this morning, if you want to experience the healing of your heart, those things are things you must believe. That Jesus has come, he has paid the death penalty that your sin deserves, that he was buried and he rose again three days later. But you need to understand this. Even though that isn't the content of their faith, the nature of their faith is exactly the same as ours. Let's look at this together. I want to give you this morning three elements of saving faith. The first one is this, recognition that he is Lord. You cannot be saved without recognizing that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is that Jesus Christ is God, that Jesus Christ is the God man. That's why the centurion trusted that his servant could be healed and it didn't even require the presence of him because he was a man under authority and he knew that he could send his servants and his will would be carried out in those in the realm of his authority. I understand this. And if you really are who you say you are, then all you need to do is speak the word because you're God of all. And you command illness and you command sickness. You command everything. Just say the word and my, my servant will be healed. There's a submission there. This is a Roman soldier. He's used to everybody bowing to him. He's used to everyone uh, listening and following his word. And here he admits, Lord. Twice he calls him Lord. Isn't that what is required in our salvation? For so, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If there is not a recognition, a willingness to allow Jesus to be the Lord of your life, then you cannot be saved. Let me say that again. If there is not a willingness on your part to be changed and let him be the ruler of your life, then you cannot be saved. I don't care what you have written in the fold of your Bible. I don't care how many times you bowed your knee at vacation Bible school. I don't care how many times you walked the aisle. If there was not an understanding in your heart that salvation involves obedience to Jesus Christ as Lord of one's life, then you cannot be saved. And this centurion understood all the power and the authority that he had he was a peon compared to the Lord. You see, the nature of his faith decision is exactly like ours. Look at the second thing. There's a recognition of our unworthiness. In verse 8, he says, I am not worthy. What does that mean? It would be quite indeed an honor if the president were to come to our church today, or if the president were to come and visit your home. But it would be highly un inappropriate for you to say, I'm not worthy to have him come into our church, or I'm not worthy to have him come into my home. Why? Because he's a human being just like you and me. He might have great, tremendous authority and, and power and responsibility, but at the same level, we're people, are we not? And yet the centurion understood something. As wealthy as he was, as powerful as he was, as influential as he was, probably had the nicest home in town. I'm not worthy to have you, if you are who you say you are, I'm not worthy to have you come in my house. You who dwelled in absolute life before the light, before the absolute foundation of the world, you who were enthroned with the Father. In glory, seated on your throne with the four angelic beasts there in your presence, I'm not worthy to have you come in my house. There's a recognition that he is God and I am not. And understand this. Again, I want to talk to the unbeliever this morning. What we typically do is we compare ourselves with other human beings. I'm a sinner compared to another sinner. And we think that God is like us. We are not thinking appropriately. God is not like us. He's not like us at all. And the primary way that God is not like us is that he is holy. He is completely set apart from sin. So when we, we got to get rid of this sliding scale of if my good outweighs my bad, baloney. God's standard is and always has been absolute moral perfection. 
And I'm sorry, you might be good when compared to other sinners. Yeah, you've maybe never murdered anybody. Maybe you've never committed adultery. Maybe you've never said God's name in vain. But you ain't perfect. You might be good when compared with another sinner, but you don't measure up to the holy standard of God who is perfect and holy. And you and I are not worthy. He alone is worthy. You see, there has to be this willingness to acknowledge that he is Lord, but secondly, there's got to be this acknowledgement that I'm not worthy. He's in a whole other category of people. Do you see yourself a sinner that you are? Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What is that fall short? You aren't worthy. And unless you see yourself as God sees you, you cannot be saved. You can't be. This is not a comparison between you and other sinful people. It's not a comparison between you and the worst of our society that you can imagine. This is a comparison between you and the God in whose image you were created. And your spiritual makeup compared to his spiritual makeup aren't even in the same universe. And if you can't come to the realization of that fact, you cannot be saved. The last thing, what did the man do? At this time, and look, I hope to clarify miracles and all that stuff at the very close of my message today because that tends to be not so practical for our experience and for our lives today. I'll talk about that in a moment. But it is highly practical and highly important at this time. Jesus Christ, the king, is offering his kingdom. One of the things he promised in the Old Testament is that when the king came and when the kingdom was being offered, miracles of healings would proceed from that. What's surprising is that this Roman citizen can have access to the king and the king's commands. And yet this Roman soldier looked, for, looked to Jesus Christ and said, I know that you can do the impossible, and he trusted him to do it. Friends, that's saving faith. It's looking to Jesus, taking him at his word, and believing that he can do it. Friends, we have a cross here on the, on the wall. This isn't the cross Jesus died on, obviously, but I often reference to this cross. Because our promise is this. That Jesus has come and he has made payment for the sin of mankind. And that only through the cross of Jesus Christ is salvation afforded to sinners like us. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. What is saving faith for us today? Friend, if you have... Corona, he can't, it's not his desire necessary, it's not his promise to heal you from corona. You might have allergies, you might have cancer, you might have back pain, you might have pancreatic, whatever, you might have illness. It's not his promise that he'll save you or heal you from those things. He might, he can, but it is his abiding promise to us that all who will admit their sin, their unworthiness, bow to Jesus as Lord and acknowledge that what Jesus did 2,000 years ago on the cross was sufficient to make payment for your sins. He promises that he'll forgive your sin. He promises that he will enter into you. He'll come close to you, sinner. He'll come into you. He'll make his home in your heart. And he will fundamentally change who you are. Didn't we hear that testimony in the baptistry this morning? I received Jesus and now I think I'm quoting Mr. Brewster perfectly. And now I live for a different purpose. So while their, the object of their faith was far different than ours, the nature of their faith was exactly the same. Recognizing that Jesus is God recognizing that we are unworthy and trusting Jesus at his word.
Look with me at chapter 8, verse 12. Back up actually to verse 11. This is Jesus marveling at the faith of the centurion. He says, I tell you, many will come from the east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I want you to see the warning here that nobody is entitled to salvation on the basis of their own merits or their family pedigree or their nationality. Just because they were Jews, and that was exactly how they thought about it. There's no way we're not going to heaven. We're, we're, we're Abraham's seed, for crying out loud. We have the Old Testament because of us. We've got the temple and the priesthood and the sacrifices and the offerings. Are you kidding me? We're in simply by virtue of our birth. Not going to heaven. Jesus said, you're right, you had truckloads of advantage, and you should believe, but because you lack faith, particularly in submission, humility, and trust, you will be cast out into outer darkness, and anyone who trusts, anyone who's humble, anyone who believes can be saved. There's a warning, isn't there? It is a fact that Jesus spoke far more about the suffering related to hell than he did about the glories of heaven. And he does it here. This faith of the centurion, it really is an amazing thing that these people who've had such advantages through the giving of the Old Testament and the temple and the priests and the offerings and the sacrifices and circumcision and all the stuff that all of it points to, to me and you're blind and you're darkened and you're dead. And yet this Roman centurion who's an outsider can see what you fail to see. He will sit at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob while you are cast into outer darkness. That place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And speaking of hell, there is a cost for not receiving Jesus as Savior. Let's look at Roman, uh, pardon me, Matthew chapter 8, verses 14 to 17. This will go quick. You're like, oh my goodness, we still got verses to go. We're going to be here forever. The pot roast is going to burn. No, you'll be all right. When Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her. And she arose and began to serve him. That evening, they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word with a word, and healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illness, he took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Okay, so I took some time in my study this week because we're going to have a lot of miracles in chapter 8, a lot of miracles in chapter 9, a lot of miracles in chapters, you know, some other chapters, and then we'll have chapter 13 and stuff, and we're going to see a lot of miracles. And as a New Testament gospel preacher... I don't know about you, it's like sometimes these are challenging to preach. In fact, I often wonder like if a, if a, like a, a brand new Bible student came in and sat among us, like they're like, I want that Jesus who can heal me and get rid of my cancer and get rid of my back pain and get rid of this and get rid of that. If he can do this for them, then he can certainly do it for me. I believe and I want that. They become hard to preach. So I just want to, and I may read this statement several times until it becomes second nature to you. Let me say something next level to some of our our. our our, our leaders, to those who would operate in Bible study and Bible leading capacities. It is incumbent upon us to identify, just like we did here, just like I did here, we have to find these elements that still connect to the gospel that we proclaim. That said, I want us to understand why the miracles, because let's just be real, legitimate miracles through an individual, I don't know that we're seeing that today. Does Jesus perform miracles? Can he? Yes. But typically not through a miracle worker. Why is that? So I prepared a statement. I'll just read it to you. I hope it's clear. If you have questions on this, please ask me afterwards. Upon reading the Gospels, it's easy to get the impression that physical healing is normal, should be expected, and follows faith. Isn't that what we just saw? 
While miracles like healings do occasionally happen today, they are by no means normal. Amen. They are normal. We can just be real about that, right? Because miracles are, means it's not normal. <laughs> this has led some into disappointment and others into deception. Right? There are charlatans out there who claim to perform and be miracle workers and they gather large numbers of people. They always gather lots of money while they do this typically. So-called miracles, but not like the stuff we see here. Discerning Bible students are left with this question. If the purpose for, miracle, uh, the purpose for miracles and physical healing, if they were not to remain a prolonged expectation, let me read that sentence again. Discerning Bible students question the purpose for miracles and physical healing if they were not to remain a prolonged expectation of believers. Fair enough question? The answer is given in Matthew chapter 8, verse 4. Look with me there. I'm sorry, not 4. should be verse, uh, verse 17. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illness and bore our diseases. Look with me at chapter 11, verse 4 real quick. 11, verse 4. This is John the Baptist. John the Baptist is wondering, are you the Messiah or do we look for another? And here's what Jesus said in Matthew 11, verse 4. Jesus answered him, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor of good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. So again, the answer to the question is given in these two verses. Jesus did not expect blind faith. His claims to be the Messiah had to be authenticated by his miracles. These miracles were intended to point people to faith in him as the Messiah. Physical healing is a characteristic of the kingdom age he was then offering to the Jews. Consequently, when Jesus Christ comes back to this earth and rules on this earth as King of kings and Lord of lords, you will again see healing like you saw here because the king will be present in his kingdom. Amen? The apostles were granted a temporary bestowment of the spirit that enabled them to work miracles for the purpose of announcing the gospel of the kingdom. The king is here. The messianic promise king is here. And look, we can perform these miracles in his name. Believe the message, believe. And they're always pointing people back to the Messiah. But when the Jews rejected their Messiah, this postponed the physical aspects of the kingdom era, such as physical peace and safety, physical healing, and longevity of life. Miracles appear on the scene for another brief time after the ascension of Jesus. So Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. After 40 days, he came back. He spent 40 days with the disciples, and then he left permanently to go to heaven. He's not been back to earth in a physical bodily form since then. For a brief time after his last departure, we see miracles emerge for a little time. The apostles and their associates were given healing power as authenticating marks of the gospel. What's the gospel? That Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again. However, it is clear those signs quickly faded. For example, Timothy was told to take a little wine for his stomach's sake. Paul was denied physical healing. The servant Epaphroditus was so sick that he almost died. Uh, and in regards to the physical needs of the church, you'll remember while Jesus was here, he fed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. And yet when Jerusalem was under great siege and in great poverty, he told the churches, you give, I'll collect an offering and I'll bring it to the churches in Jerusalem. So the physical needs of the church were supplied through the generosity of believers, not through miraculous means. Clearly, the gifts of healing and miracles were waning or absent by the end of 65 AD. Even during Jesus' ministry, miracles served a greater purpose than meeting physical needs. This is seen in the feeding of the 5,000 when Jesus refused to feed the multitude a second day because their hunger for food had obscured their greater spiritual hunger. Do you remember that? Does Jesus have the ability to feed these people every day and twice on Sunday? Every day, snap, 5,000 fed, snap, 5,000 fed. You know what? I don't even want to do it with a snap anymore. I'm just going to think it, and boom, it happens. Does he have the ability to do that? Yes, but he did not. Why? Because it wasn't his purpose. 
The miracle served a purpose pointing to a deeper need, the spiritual need of the heart. Those who see Jesus only as a provider of physical needs will likely miss their greater need of spiritual rebirth by his death and resurrection. So while, these physical, while, so while the physical peace, safety, and healing associated with the kingdom age are largely postponed, the spiritual peace, safety, and healing that Jesus offered remains active and available for all who believe. We are not wrong to ask for physical healing or miraculous intervention, and there are examples of God's divine intervention in the New Testament books. But we are wise to live carefully, give sacrificially, and seek the ordinary means of grace for our temporary needs and ailments. For believers, physical healing is not a matter of if, but when. For believers... Physical healing is not a matter of if, but when. We will be all permanently healed and changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. But the primary healing that is to be sought today is the transformation of the heart. And so this morning, while I cannot offer to you that Jesus will take away your cancer or take away your back pain or take away your arthritis or take away all of those confusing things of your life, I can promise you this, that if you will acknowledge Jesus Christ as God, you will acknowledge yourself to be an unworthy sinner in the presence of that God. And you will acknowledge that Jesus Christ has paid the death penalty for your sins and is risen again. He promises that he will heal you. That he promises. So what are the takeaway lessons for today? You've got some blanks in your bulletin. If you didn't get a bulletin, you better write fast. Number one, salvation is available to all who believe. Oh my goodness, I'm going over. All right, we're almost done. Number two, faith is required for salvation. Number three, saving faith is seen in submission, humility, and trust. I think we've hit that one. Plenty. Submission. He is Lord. Humility. I am unworthy and clean. Trust Jesus' power to heal, cleanse, forgive. A little statement there. Our faith is more precise than theirs. That's the leper and the centurion. And must include trust in the death and resurrection of Jesus as full payment for our sin. Number three, or number four, unbelief results in divine rejection and judgment. Physical healing is an expectation associated only with Christ's offer of the kingdom, which is currently on hold. If you want to learn more about that, you can read Romans chapter 11. We are not wrong to ask for healing, but it is not a normative expectation for the church age. That's the time period that we live in. Church. This morning, we're going to sing, Jesus, what a friend of sinners. I'm going to ask the worship team if they join me up here. Let's sing this joyfully to the Lord, recognition that uh, he's willing to save us. We come to him in faith, acknowledging our sin.